Thanks a lot, Adam, and thank you, everybody, for, for coming. So we've got about 50 minutes in which I will hopefully equi equip you with some philosophical tools that will enable you to exit the room with an answer, a personal answer, to the question, should you fear your own death? Or should, rather, should each individual fear his or her own death? So the question I'm posing here is asked in the first person, okay? I'm not asking whether we should fear the death of other people, because obviously we have very good reasons to, to fear that as well. But solely the first personal existential question, is death something each and every one of us should face with trepidation, with equanimity, or with another kind of attitude? And I'm going to talk about two very different views two very different answers on this question. Epicurus, the ancient Greek philosopher, and Heidegger, the 20th century German philosopher. So here's the challenge. This is a reformulation of a point uh, made originally by Socrates. And this is Michel de Montaigne. He says, all the wisdom and argument in the world comes down to one conclusion, which is to teach us not to be afraid of dying. The point of philosophy, Montaigne uh, states in his essay, and again, he's uh, standing on the shoulders of giants like Socrates and the Stoics, is to teach us to face death with courage, with equanimity, and with fearlessness. What does that actually mean? It means several different things, and it might mean different things yet for other, each and every one of you. Montaigne's point is that the exercise of philosophical argument is an impassioned, um, theoretical, structured experience, and as such should help us to overcome some of our fears that are associated with death. However, he also acknowledges the very raw emotional content of this fear. There is something incredibly frightening in thinking about one's own non-existence or annihilation, whether one believes in um, some kind of afterlife or, or not. So this is a challenge that I think doesn't just stand at the basis of a lot of philosophical um, endeavors and much of existentialist philosophy, for example, much of um, ancient philosophy, but is actually a question that tacitly engages each and every one of us, probably every single day. Whether we make that tacit question explicit or not is a different matter. And the role of philosophy, Montaigne tells us, is to make that question explicit and to confront it in some way. His view isn't prescriptive. He doesn't tell us how exactly or in which of the many ways one could not be afraid of dying. We ought to do that. But he certainly thinks that a central role of philosophy as a discipline, as an activity, is to give us that opportunity to reflect on what it means to die, and what it means to live in such a way so that death becomes less fearful, less daunting, less threatening. And I think a lot of what we do in our everyday life is resist making that question explicit, is insist on keeping it tacit by putting it out of our minds, by fleeing from it, as Heidegger says, by um, addressing it with humor or denial or some other kind of rejection. What I want to do in the next um, hour or so is to resist all of these attitudes and to try and deal with it without resorting to either fleeing, denial, humor, or rejection. So there will be no, absolutely no jokes in this talk. So this is the challenge, to learn not to be afraid of dying. How do we do it? Montaigne tells us, through the study and practice of philosophy.
Why should we do it? We should do it both so we can die well, die, um, face our end of life with at least some of the virtues we normally uh, think about in that context, maybe with equanimity, maybe with acceptance, but also so that we can live reflectively, live with the knowledge that we die, but without fear of that knowledge. Now, of course, people don't just drop dead or disappear um, one day. Death is normally caused by illness. And part of what I want to do today is suggest that understanding one necessitates also understanding the other. But in order for us to understand mortality, we have to also understand our vulnerability. In order for us to <clears throat> embrace our limited, finite existence, we also need to understand that we are fleshly, bodily creatures with quite a lot of limitations. So, the moral conclusion or the moral lesson one can draw from thinking about death and illness is an appreciation of what Alistair McIntyre calls our vulnerable, dependent, animal state. And what that means is that we live as members of a society, we're born into dependency. Each and every one of us started life as a creature about this long that was unable to do any of the things that we now take for granted. We couldn't walk, we couldn't talk, we couldn't eat solid food, we couldn't do anything, and would have perished within several hours if it weren't for other people who were looking after us, each in their own way. And this dependence, as McIntyre um, states in his wonderful book, <clears throat> Dependent Rational Animals, this dependence has gone underappreciated in contemporary philosophy for at least 50 years. And what McIntyre tries to do, and what I um, would like to um, suggest here today as well, is that instead of thinking of ourselves as autonomous, independent creatures, we might want to shift the focus, shift our attention, shift our perspective, and think of ourselves as rather dependent, non-autonomous, and deeply and intimately connected to and reliant upon other people. So we're dependent because we're vulnerable, and we're vulnerable because we're animals and because our bodies are open to all kinds of frailty, adversity, trauma, injury, of the kind that I hope none of the people in this room have to experience. So the animality and the vulnerability lead to dependence, and that dependence, once appreciated, would lead us to think about moral philosophy, political philosophy, possibly metaphysics, in slightly different ways than we do now. So our identity is primarily bodily, and we must appreciate and acknowledge the affliction and the vulnerability and the resulting dependence as they reveal themselves in our lives. And McIntyre's point is that no matter how much we try to buffer ourselves from such afflictions, we're always open to them. An accident, an injury, a mishap, a bereavement, a separation, a loss of one's home, all of these things are not things we welcome, but they're also not entirely impossible events. And the appreciation of the fact of their possibility <clears throat> is what cultivates McIntyre's view on ethics. So I want us to understand death not as some abstract philosophical concept, but as something that is very intimately connected to the issues I've just, um, I've just described about vulnerability, uh, vulnerability and dependence. 
But let's go back to death. So how should we face our death? Is it something that we need to be fearful of, <clears throat> or is another attitude more appropriate? So I'll start out by talking about Heidegger, who considered death to be a very powerful structuring element of human life. Indeed, he thought of human life as nothing but a being towards death. <clears throat> and this is his slightly depressing point. Every day we live is a day that brings us one day closer to our death. Of course, we don't know when we're going to die or how we're going to die. None of us know that. But regardless of when the event itself takes place, its horizon, the possibility of it happening, looms large over human existence, says Heidegger. And for him, death and finitude are what structure existence. And here is what he says in the fundamental concepts of metaphysics. Finitude is not some property that is merely attached to us, but is our fundamental way of being. And you could, of course, read this in one of two ways. You could think of finitude of, as temporal finitude or death, and you could think of finitude as finitude of possibility, which is connected to this vulnerability and dependence that McIntyre emphasizes. I know this is not a very natural connection to make between McIntyre and Heidegger, but I hope um, it makes sense. So for Heidegger, what happens once we acknowledge that we are a being towards death, our view of temporality changes because we stop thinking of time as an infinite resource and start thinking of time, of temporality as a finite temporality. It affects the kinds of actions and choices we make. And every choice we make is choosing one <coughs> set possibility over a host of other ones which are now closed off to us. This is both an ontological claim about how humans are structured or how human life is structured, and of course also an epistemic claim about what we know or need to know about our finitude. And in his view, Heidegger makes an interesting connection between life and death. Death is no longer some far-fetched event somewhere far away in the future of which we have no knowledge and about which we needn't worry in the present. On the contrary, for Heidegger, life and death are intimately linked. And life only makes sense in light of being finite. Now, Heidegger was a phenomenologist. So he used or developed uh, or partook in a philosophical tradition called phenomenology. And phenomenology is the science or the study of, um, of phenomena, of things as they appear to us. And phenomenology is interested in the way in which human consciousness encounters the world, encounters other people, encounters things in the world, our environment. Um, phenomenology's task is to describe that encounter. And of course, once you know Heidegger is a phenomenologist, a very natural question to ask is, well, how could possibly could you do a phenomenology of death, which is an experiential blank? On Heidegger's view, he held <coughs> um, the view that death is simply the cessation of all life and consciousness. And therefore, once somebody dies, they simply are in a state of an experiential blank. There is nothing it is like for Heidegger to be dead. Okay, so this is, I would, well, I wouldn't want to say a secular view in the context of Heidegger, but broadly speaking, <clears throat> it is a view that denies that there is an afterlife. So how are we going to do a phenomenology? How are we going to provide a description of something that is an experiential blank? Of course, we don't experience our own death because once we die, we're annihilated and we don't have any experiences whatsoever. But also, Heidegger says, we don't experience the death of others. 
And he says that when we witness someone dying, all we see is one minute there's a person there, and the next minute there is a corpse. There is um, what he calls a present at hand entity, it's a lifeless bit of matter. What we don't experience is the actual death. So we don't experience our own death, and we don't experience the death of others. And also, he says, in his analysis of death, he's not providing an analysis of demise. Demising for him is the moment at which uh, a biological organism becomes inert matter. What we can have a phenomenology of is of dying, of the process of living as finite. So he doesn't mean dying in the sense of somebody taking their last breath, so the last two days of someone's life, or um, someone's last three months once they're given a, a terminal prognosis, but of dying as living. So living for him simply is dying. I don't think he intended this in a particularly dark and depressing way. I think he merely wants to point our attention towards the structure of human existence, which is that of finite temporality. Or in other words, he's not giving us a phenomenology of death, but a phenomenology of being towards death, which is what each and every one of us is and does. What does this phenomenology look like? Here he is again, in history of the concept of time. It's based on a fundamental certainty that I myself am in that I will die as the basic certainty of Dasein, the human being. In so far as I am, I am moribundus, he says. I am death-bound. So what does the structure of human existence um, look like for Heidegger? Here is a schematic illustration of his, um, his account, which is given in Division One of his book, Being in Time, in 1927 publication. Here is the human being stretching from birth to death with the three temporal uh, modes we're familiar with, the past, the present, and the future. And this stretch simply is the human life. The human life, which he characterizes as comprised of three elements. Thrownness, the fact that we find ourselves thrown into a particular historical period, into a particular family, into a particular culture or historical period. Throwness is our past and is all the things we cannot choose and have never chosen. And the past weighs us down to an extent and grounds us in a particular identity. But we also have the future, or a process which he calls projection. So we project ourselves into the future by choosing to press into particular possibilities over other ones. So you have all chosen to come here at one o'clock today, and by making that positive choice, you've closed off a host of other possibilities to um, have lunch with a friend, to um, while away your life on the internet, to uh, travel to some faraway place, or to rob a bank, okay? So a host of other possibilities have been closed down. So the human being is this continuous tension between the thrownness and the givenness and the projection and its associated openness. So human being is this thrown projection, which is also fallen into the world. And that's the existential mode that Heidegger associates with the present. What does he mean by fallen into the world? How are we fallen? And is that a good thing or a bad thing? There's about 5,000 books and twice as many articles trying to answer that very question. But I'll just briefly say that being, having fallen into the world means for Heidegger being immersed in the everyday. And this immersion or fallenness are, something that, are things that have to be both resisted 
resisted in the form of reflection and the quest for individual authenticity, but that are also always present, not just um, contingently, but are always present uh, as part of our very structure. So we have this double pull between thrownness and projection, and we also have the double pull within fallenness of being immersed in the world, being caught up in the moment, being engaged and um, committed to a particular project. And the opposite force of reflection and withdrawal that might cause us to question or uh, have a critical stance towards that fallenness. But then, of course, you'd say, well, what do you project towards? We project towards individual projects that we might be engaged in. So your project is, say, that of being students, being undergraduates or postgraduates at the University of Bristol. And when you finish that, you, there'll be another project of finding a job or going traveling. And then there'll be another project of, I don't know, paying your mortgage. It becomes more depressing as time passes. And eventually, Heidegger says, the ultimate project is simply one of living this life that is directed towards death. So the ultimate projection is projecting towards death. And here is another tension in Heidegger's thought. Projection implies possibility. You can't project towards the future if no possibilities are open to you. But of course, death is the possibility of the impossibility of having any possibility at all, which is a direct quote from Heidegger. So death is simply the possibility of no longer being able to be there, of, of ceasing to exist. And that is the ultimate contradiction that underpins human life, which is that we live with our attention and our goals directed towards the future, and ultimately that future ends in annihilation ends in the impossibility of existence, which is death. For Heidegger, death is also untimely. And that means that it never, there, it never comes at the perfect moment. It, it, always, it is always either too early or too late. And he characterizes death as having this threefold structure. It is my own most, it is non-relational, <clears throat> and it's not to be outstripped. Own most simply means it belongs to each and every one of us. And as Freud once famously wrote in uh, an essay from 1916, we each owe nature a death. So death is our own most in the sense that even though somebody else could sacrifice their life to you, for you, or um, donate an organ if you really need one, and thus postpone your death, they can't take your own death away from you. Because ultimately, this existential stance of facing this montanian challenge of not to be afraid of dying belongs intimately to each and every one of us. It's non-relational because <clears throat> it cuts us off <clears throat> from our usual fallenness, from our immersion in the everyday world. And it's not to be outstripped because we never, we only ever anticipate death. We never experience it and of course we never look back at it. So if you take another e event in life, say, I don't know, your, your birthday party, it might be in the future. So oh, next week is my birthday, are you going to come? Then time passes and it's your birthday in the present you're having your amazing party with all your friends. And then the next day you wake up in the morning, not feeling so good, and think, oh, that was okay last night, my birthday party. You can view it from these three temporal modes. You can view it as a future event, you can experience it in the present, and then you can view it as a past event. Death is different. We can only ever have a future um, it, it, we can only ever view it as a future event. We never experience it in the present because we can't experience our own death. And we certainly can't view it as a past event um, for the obvious reason. 
So death is not to be outstripped. And here's Vladimir Nabokov, an invitation to a beheading, making a Heideggerian comment that I think illustrates some of these themes. The compensation for a death sentence is knowledge of the exact hour when one is to die. A great luxury, but one that is well earned. However, I am being left in that ignorance which is tolerable only to those living at liberty. And this is spoken by a prisoner on death row called Cincinnatus, who um, in the novella wakes up every morning not knowing whether today will be the day of his execution. And this is his complaint to his jailer, saying it's not fair, this is tolerable only to those who are free. Okay, so for Heidegger, death is the horizon of existence. It is something we each have to take over in every case. And the good news is that this <clears throat> fact about our life, once understood authentically, frees us to exist in an authentic manner as our own most ability to be. So as embracing the choices and living in ways that are intimately ours, that are our own most, that are chosen and embraced by us. And this also, also enables us to exist as a whole because we are never, once we take the understanding of death and finite temporality as structuring the horizon of life, we're no longer living as creatures who lack that final bit of their existence or lack an understanding of that final bit of their existence. Now, there are authentic and inauthentic ways to be towards death. An inauthentic way is to flee in the face of death. And that means simply avoid, evade, escape, run away from any kind of serious discussion. And I think when people... Um, say, oh, I don't want to think about whether I want to join the donor organ reg register, for example. That's a form of inauthentic fleeing, saying, I'm really uncomfortable with discussing th this possibility, so I'm just going to talk about it next, year, next week or next year. So that's the inauthentic mode. The authentic mode of being towards death, says Heisiger, is one of anticipation. And anticipation doesn't entail being very excited or positive about one's death. What it does entail is a very deep self-understanding of ourselves as finite, of our possibilities as being there only once, and of each passing day as being a unique, non-repeatable expression of our self-understanding and our choices. And this is, uh, I thought I'd show you Heidegger's grave to uh, illustrate his, uh, his views of being towards death. Okay, so this is one answer. Now, entirely different view is given to us by Epicurus, who suggests to us that the role of philosophy is to help us to deal with fears, upsets, the things that prevent us from being happy. And he thought that philosophy was in fact a form of medicine for the soul, as he put it. Why do we need medicine for the soul? Well, says Epicurus, the main obstacle to happiness is anxiety. We're scared and worried about a lot of things, and these are what prevent us from being happy. If it were possible to understand the irrationality of such anxieties, and he does that through um, providing rational arguments on the, uh, about this, uh, this irrationality, then suffering can be removed. So it's a very kind of neat surgical account of anxieties and obstacles to happiness, saying, all we need to do is to reflect rationally with the tools of philosophy. And if we do it consistently and systematically, then we can rid ourselves of all anxiety and reach the state of tranquility or ataraxia. Uh, 
So philosophy has a therapeutic role and has an arsenal of therapeutic arguments that are intended to help us in this attempt. So the most important slide of the talk, the Epicurean tetrapharmacon, the four-part cure. Here's what he says, don't fear God. And the reason is that God or the gods in the plural as was the case for him, because the gods are these divine perfect creatures who simply don't care much about the individual failings we might display as human beings. They're not there to punish us and supervise our actions. He thinks that's a very infantile view of, of gods. So we have nothing to fear about. Um, when we think about God. Don't worry about death, which I'll talk about in a minute. And then he says two more things. He says, what is good is easy to get. So things like mental tranquility, friendship, being self-sufficient, these are all things that are easy to get or that are achievable for Epicurus. And finally, what is terrible is easy to endure. And this is possibly the least convincing of the four parts of the cure. Slightly kind of sophistical tone here. He says, if the suffering is terrible, then it's bound to be short. And if it lasts a long time, then it's not that terrible. It's, it's chronic, but it's, it's not going to kill you. So this is the four part cure. And he spent all his time trying to explain to people how they could bring about this achievement of, of tranquility, how they could dispel the anxieties and the worries, the petty concerns, the competitiveness, the greed, the um, craving for status and wealth and external goods in order to achieve true tranquility. So now focusing exclusively on the second line, don't worry about death. Why does he say that? What arguments does he provide us with to dispel this irrational fear we have? Here's what Epicurus says. I hope. Well, we should only worry about things we can experience. Okay, so he's a, he's a hedonist. Not a hedonist in the sense that he thinks every day is an opportunity for you know, champagne and caviar, but in the sense that for him, we should only care about things we can experience. And of course, death is not such a thing. So we should only worry about things we can experience. Death is a state of non-existence and therefore of non-experience. In other words, there is nothing it is like to be dead. And therefore, we should not worry about our death. This is argument number one. Here's another one. This is his famous analogy to prenatal non-existence. He says, being dead, sorry, is the same as not existing before, before birth, right? So I've shown you this diagram of life as being a stretch between birth and death. Nobody's sad about their prenatal non-existence. Nobody ever feels fear or worry or um, dissatisfaction at the fact that they didn't exist before they were conceived. So this argument hinges on you accepting this um, first premise that there is an analogy between prenatal non-existence and death. And then of course we're not troubled by prenatal non-existence, therefore we shouldn't be bothered by posthumous non-existence. So these are the two arguments. Somebody could still come back to Epicurus and say, well, should we fear suffering then? I mean, death might be a state of non-existence, but the process of dying, from what we've seen in films or heard in stories or read about in books, looks very painful indeed. So what might still bother us, something we might be truly anxious and, and rightfully and rationally anxious about is the thought of dying in pain or, the, or suffering prior to death. 
And here, if you recall, in the four-part cure, he's told us that what is terrible is easy to endure. And Epicurus could also say it is not a fear of death. A fear of suffering that we can experience within life is something we need to take issue with in a, a very different way to death, which is simply not an event we can experience. Now, just one more thing about his hedonism, because it's so often misunderstood. Um, and I think people use the, uh, the term an Epicurean in this rather misleading sense. And here is what he says in his famous letter to Menesius. When we say that pleasure is the goal, we do not mean the pleasures of the profligate or the pleasures of consumption, as some believe but rather that lack of pain in the body and disturbance in the soul. And this is the true beauty, I think, of his view. Is that it seems so unambitious because he says, all I really want, all I aspire to, is for lack of bodily pain, aponia, and lack of mental anguish, ataraxia. But if you think about it, and this is a comment made by the French... Um, ancient Greek scholar Pierre Adon, abolishing successfully all forms of bodily and mental suffering is simply a state of perfect happiness. There could be nothing better than that, um, that state. So this is just to dispel the idea that Epicurus, um, Epicurean hedonism means something um, that it doesn't. And then finally, what is good is easy to get. So we've mentioned friendship and tranquility. But of course, you might want to be a little bit hard on Epicurus and say, what if you're pathologically shy or you find it very difficult to make friends? Doesn't he help himself a little bit too much here to the idea that friendship is easy to get? Maybe it's easy to get for most people, or certainly for Epicurus, but maybe it's not so easy to get for other people. And similarly, tranquility. Who doesn't want to be tranquil? But we all know that the challenge of achieving true tranquility is enormously big, and that there are many forms of suffering, starting from the mundane, um, not having milk in the fridge, and ending with the really kind of traumatic experiences that people sometimes have um, living in difficult domestic situations, suffering accidents or ill health, or um, being plagued by some form of, of mental disorder, like depression or anxiety. And I say this simply to acknowledge that there's, there's a bigger complexity to be unpacked, not today, but with respect to um, the fourfold cure and the claims he makes about the... Um, the easy achievability of goodness in, in that regard. But here's a rather compelling Epicurean quote, I think, which helps us to see Epicurean hedonism as a form of self-sufficiency that is aimed at delivering us from the incessant suffering that arises from relying on external goods. What makes people unhappy, says Epicurus, is their greed, their reliance on um, wealth, their um, need to be recognized in terms of status or what have you. And his ideal of self-sufficiency means that we rely on ourselves and we train ourselves so that our needs become such that they do not require external goods in order to be satisfied. So um, an example he gives is of barley cakes and water. If we eat barley cakes to satisfy our hunger and drink water to quench our thirst, we do not become reliant on some fancy, I don't know, ostrich burger and some very posh wine in order to satisfy ourselves. And that, for him, is a very deep source of liberty, of freedom, because you'd, you're not reliant on these external goods whose contingent nature mean that 
you open yourself to the possibility of suffering because of their absence. What if all the ostriches die out and there's no more wine? What would the person do? Then the barley cakes and water person triumphs. And here's how he puts it. The cry of the flesh. Not to be hungry, not to be thirsty, not to be cold. For if someone has these things and is confident of having them in the future, he might contend even with Zeus for happiness. So, how should we live as finite? We've seen two incredibly different approaches. We've seen Heidegger's call on us to anticipate death as authentic living. And we've seen Epicurus claiming almost the exact opposite, that the fear of death is irrational and can and ought to be dissipated by rational arguments. I won't and I don't want to settle the argument between the two of them, because the main point of <clears throat> what I've been saying is that it's very important to understand our finitude. It's very important to acknowledge our dependence. And each and every person sitting in this room will do it in their own way. Thank you very much.